Welcome back to Light the Fuse. This episode, Charles, I'm feeling a little outnumbered. Okay, we got two young, hot, independent filmmakers on the program and just little old me. So, you know, I'm feeling... Wow. Feeling a little outnumbered, a little outgunned, but you know what? It's a lively, amazing conversation and... Guess I just gotta fe- you know own up to it. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess it's uh, it's time to own up. Um, it's time to pay the piper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Drew. Uh, yes, uh, Ben David's uh, amazing filmmaker. He's he's uh, he's working on the is it the Scott Pilgrim animated show? Well, he is, we think, but he was uh, really pulling some shenanigans with us. He would not <laughs> confirm or deny that, but yes, we assume he, would... he is. We don't know. We don't know. Yes. And he also had a movie that came out last year called Happily, which is on VOD, and uh, I believe it's also on Roku Channel with ads. But you can rent it and and, and buy it on Apple or Vudu or wherever you get your movies, uh, video on demand. So, yeah, so it was a, a pleasure to have him. He's got a he's got an IMF tattoo. Once we heard that, and and also that he ran a MI2 fan site back in the late '90s, we were like, oh my god, please, we have to talk to <laughs> <Yeah>. you. <laughs> yeah, this is a really fun chat. And, um, yeah, I mean, the fandom, it come it comes at you from all different angles, all different sides. And to hear somebody running a Mission Impossible 2 fan site is just uh, just made our hearts sore. So yeah. I think that this is a pretty funny, uh, great episode that we hope everybody enjoys. Yeah. And um, I, apologies in advance. Uh, we I think I think it's in this week's episode that we had we had some sirens in the background that are a little bit loud and you know nothing we could do about that so just uh just wanted to say that uh sorry about that you're gonna hear some sirens go by in the middle of the chat but uh it's still great we have a great conversation with ben david and uh you should uh drew do your favorite part of the show okay well uh this episode is brought to you by jeremy Dillon and his podcast my favorite album where each week he talks to a different filmmaker songwriter composer actor about the music they love and how it's influenced them and their work. And Charles, you and I have been on a few times now, and we just are just waiting for our next our next return appearance. And he's, he's great. And then this episode is also brought to you by John B. And also Elvis Ripley, who is a cinematographer who was inspired by Rogue Nation. And that has kind of like informed the rest of his work. So we're so thankful for all of these amazing people. And let's get into it. And we'll be back after the chat, right? Yeah. Okay. Welcome back to Light the Fuse, a Mission Impossible podcast who is not content to have one independent filmmaker on the show but we have two this week ben david grubinski how you doing thank you so much for coming on uh i've been really excited to be invited on night the owls uh this is my favorite podcast about the night owls franchise Uh, (laughs) i'm just you know i want to talk about how you got the guy from sports night (laughs) <laughs> you know, I want to know like exact like what were his dietary restrictions? <laughs> like how how many days did he shoot? Did he have his own makeup chair, or was this just like a? I you know I can't really tell the scale of it because on one hand it looks like it could be a gigantic like IMAX release. On the other, it might have just been <laughs> run and gun. So I'm just been trying to figure that out. Night Owls was was IMAX exclusive. It was exclusive. Yeah. That's that's it. <laughs> See, if it had been in the Dolby Cinema, I would have seen it by now. But IMAX, I just don't like as much. No offense to the corporation if they're listening. Right? Yeah, <laughs> oh, totally understandable. And you are a Mission Impossible super fan, correct? Can we can we see your tattoo now, or is it on a part of your body that we cannot? Uh, see? No, it's right. How do I? Turn that way, unless I turn. Oh, so it's the, wow. That's great. We, we're going to have to get a real good picture of that and put it on our show notes for people to see. Yeah, you should just freeze like this, and I'm just doing this big... <laughs> no, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll have like some professional photographer <laughs> yes. uh, chronicle my great life decisions I've made. When, what, when did that get added? What was that? What year was that? So I had one tattoo pre-pandemic, <laughs> and now I have 19. 
So <laughs> if, if you do the math right, that means I've been getting one a year since the pandemic started. Uh, that's a joke <laughs> implying that the pandemic feels like it lasted a really long time. The, the yeah. best jokes you need to explain. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, um, I just had one Twin Peaks one, which brought me a lot of good luck. And uh, I got a couple more during the lockdown. And what I found is like, they gave me like some sort of sense of control or something. So uh, this is a uh, light the couch, the therapy podcast right now. <laughs> but I just want to tell you like how I, like getting the tattoos made me feel like I had control in a world where there was a lack of it. So what I did was I got a bunch so, you know, like anything in life, you should do too much of it. Um, so was it when the Mission when Mission Impossible 7 got delayed, you felt totally out of control and you had to go get this IMF tattoo? Is that what that's happened? That's us, Charles. I, think that's <laughs> I mean, us. Yeah. I have like six Top Gun tattoos from every time they delayed that. So <laughs> I don't recommend to people to make your tattoo choices <laughs> contingent upon movies being delayed in these tumultuous yeah. times. Uh, but no, I was um, I was just making a list of like stuff that like, I really love and like I ways to like have interesting iconography. And I was just thinking, you know, I'm a big supporter of the impossible mission force. I just think it's the only non-corrupt agency in the United States government right now. So <laughs> I want to just go around. They and deal with this. quite a bit of corruption in the, uh, in the series. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny because there's like multiple versions of it. And I was showing them to the person who does all my tattoos and all the other ones had like an American flag. And then there was one that didn't, she's like, I think that's the winner. And I think so too, <laughs> because I don't think, you know, the impossible mission force works for everyone unless you're a corrupt mole from the IMF, but they work for, ev they're there for everybody else yeah. in the world, I think. Yeah, I think I have a, we both have pins of that version of the logo, right? Yes, uh, yeah, I have a pin of that. That's about how as committed we can get to uh, putting something on our body, just having it on our jacket for a short period of time, taking it off, but you really, you committed. We don't have uh, any tattoos, so if we did have a tattoo, that's probably the way we'd go. The previous <laughs> commitment I had was purely an item of clothing that I wore a lot until it no longer fit me, which was a uh, Expect the Impossible shirt from the Apple promotion from the first movie when they're yes. trying to like sell the power book. And I found it like at a vintage store, and it was like, it was my favorite. That was a pretty dope shirt. <laughs> it's like pretty cool font like retro Apple stuff. But you know, what happens in life sometimes is when you start to eat more and be more lethargic, these shirts <laughs> that at one point fit you may no longer fit you. And there's probably a metaphor in there somewhere, but I don't know. <laughs> but the point is, I, I, I had to get something on my arm so I didn't have to worry about perspective shirt sizes like maybe i'd find some kind of like limp biscuit mtv movie awards vintage shirt from <laughs> mi2 uh and then that i could go and maybe end up too big too small i don't know well you brought up mission impossible 2 we have to talk about your your website yeah i mean the coolest thing that i ever did and by that i mean the opposite so <laughs> when the first mission impossible came out my favorite movie was aliens uh, and I saw Mission Impossible um, as a kid, the first one. And there, I lived near a dollar theater in, in Arizona. And um, I saw it in the dollar theater because, you know, my parents weren't going to pay full price. And uh, but after I went, I went back a bunch because it was like PG-13. So my parents would let me go. And I kind of had to go because I didn't understand anything on the first viewing. And then I kind of had to go because it was like my new favorite movie. So like my favorite movie is Mission Impossible until I got really into this guy called John Woo. So when uh, face, I saw Face Off, I've probably seen Face Off more than like any movie ever. Like part of it is because when it came out on video, I was like in the hospital and uh, I only had a copy of that, Liar Liar and Gone Fishing. So I mainly just watched <laughs> uh, Face Off. But you know, if you really think about it, I had two core representatives of the Mission Impossible franchise. I had Gone Fishing written by JJ. Right. And then Face <laughs> Off, uh, directed by John Woo. So, you know, I was like, I wanted to be a filmmaker when I grew up. And, you know, I, I was like the kind of idiot who read the trades living in like Phoenix, Arizona or whatever when I was 15. And when they announced Mission Impossible 2, it felt like the universe was saying, hey, 
What are your two favorite things, Mission Impossible and Face Off? What if, just what if, for one moment, they collided? <laughs> so I was, like, the most excited dude in the entire world. And, like, I had spent a lot of time reading, like, this website that was, like, all about Lost World that ran for a couple of years running into it. It was, like, called, like, Dan's The Lost World page or something. And, like, every day they'd have an update from, like, fan stuff or spies or lies or merchandise things. And I would check that, like, every day. So I had this harebrained idea. Someone needs to make that for Mission Impossible 2. So I had a website for Mission Impossible 2 when I was, like, 15. So through the release, I was, like, 17 when it came out. And then, like, probably, like, six months after, that was, like, my main passion was running a, a website in anticipation of Mission Impossible 2. And I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's part of the Mission Impossible franchise. So <laughs> as some, some people try to act like it's not, and it, it breaks my heart. Like, actually, the only thing on your show I don't like is it's like, I mean, like, my, one of my favorite production designers ever, or DP, or editor. And some will say something about Mission Impossible 2, and they usually go, yeah, that one sucked ass. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> just move on to the other ones. Like, I was just listening to one the other day, and the guy's like, well, the second one is obviously terrible. And both of you were like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Anyway. And then that's like all you ever say about the second one. And I, I think that it's like not, but it's, uh, it has problems, but it's like, it's a bummer for me because it's like, you know, you have to, if you like Mission Impossible 2 a lot, you just have like a complicated life because you have to <laughs> just, there's this noise around you of people being like, Hey, that thing you like sucks. And you just have to like, accept that. But you know, it's not the most fun fandom to be part of. Like, you know, the, I don't think there's, there's sometimes, there's like a few people on film Twitter who are like great action obsessives who like see some of the worth of it. And, you know, and they're cool. And they'll post like gifts every once in a while of the movie. And you're like, hey man, there's some solidarity. But anyway, what am I even talking about? There, there are some believers out there. It seems like there are some people who are coming out of the woodwork over the last few years on Twitter. I mean, we, we love all our Mission Impossible children. Well, I think, like, my main thesis about Mission Impossible 2 is that if it had, in, like, no disrespect to the OG Wolverine, Doug Gray Scott, or Do Gray Scott, or whatever, no offense for not knowing what your name is, sir. <laughs> the, pro the real problem with the movie is, like, there's Tom Cruise is larger than life, and he's, like, in love with this woman, and there's a love triangle, and the other guy really needed to be, like, a movie star. Right. So the I think the real imbalance of the movie is you need a, someone who's, like, this gigantic megawatt charisma to be the villain. And if the movie ever felt like she was choosing between the two of them, or, like, he's a guy who's, like, evil but, like, so charming you kind of like him, I think it would make everything kind of work better because it feels like the movie to like be that over the top and that kind of theatrical it needs like the actor energy to kind of work within that like the best john woo movies are like there's like four guys in the lead who are like incredibly charismatic it's like you know even like better going back to hard boiled or just even face off it's like everybody in that movie is like fucking going for it and they have like the chops to go for it and Mission Impossible 2 is really just like Tom Cruise is the only one who's really going for it and can go for it. And then there's also just that guy who was the worst Dracula ever, who's like part of their group, who like he kind of goes for it, but not in like a good way. I just think like if you if that movie, I think I'll, people would forgive a lot more if there was like not Travolta exactly, but someone of that kind of operatic scene chewing kind of actor quality to be the bad guy. And as is, it just sort of feels like there's no antagonist at all in the movie that needs an antagonist the most. Like, I love Ghost Protocol, but, like, I keep forgetting there even is a bad guy in it. But, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's really everything I have to say about Mission Impossible 2, besides the fact that I really like the score. I think the locations are great, except the final motorcycle chase was supposed to be in downtown Sydney, but they couldn't get enough permits to shoot it and shut down the streets. So it's just, like, on these dirt roads. Yeah. But, uh... Have you heard Charles is uh, gay reading of Mission Impossible 2? Uh, I am I believe I did. Charles, do you want to recite this at all? Well, I just think that it's, I mean, the movie is, they wear this on their sleeve. They, they've acknowledged that it's very indebted to Hitchcock and in particular Notorious. But I think beyond Notorious, I think it's also very indebted to North by Northwest with the villain 
story because the 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 uh, dynamic that Doug Ray Scott has with Richard Roxborough seems very similar to James Mason and Martin Landau in North by Northwest, which is this little kind of almost somewhat romantic maybe subplot that goes on in the background where you know Martin Landau is a little jealous of uh, Eva Marie Saint and uh, Richard Roxborough is kind of a little bit jealous of Tandy Newton. Thoughts? I think that basically you might have just nailed the whole thing i think you just blew you, i think you just blew this case wide open i think just i don't know i mean there's that scene you've nailed the scene where he gets mad at him where where doug ray scott like bends over richard roxborough in front of him and like cuts off his finger it's very suggestive the way that it's staged and shot and even the dialogue straight up where he's like what does he say like you're I forget what the line he says. Um, uh, something about gagging for it. Look, the the most important thing we need to acknowledge is that the finger chomping thing, that's from Dark Man, and Sam Raimi oh, produced yeah. Hard Target. So I'm just going to choose to believe that was an homage to Sam Raimi. <laughs> and I am basing this on nothing. I love that. So what I think you need to do is you need to get Sam Raimi on this podcast. Uh, oh, yeah. the guest, The guest I've been waiting for the whole time and maybe you got him and I missed it, but I don't think you did. I remember that part. You may have gotten him, and I remember it was Joel Gallen, who directed the MTV Music Awards sketch of Mission Impossible 2, which is one of the greatest things ever made by human oh, beings. Mission Improbable? Uh, the Ben Stiller yeah, thing? Yeah, when he says we've been working together since TPS, <laughs> is why don't you just call it TAPS? <laughs> like, it's just... <laughs> Like we haven't gotten him yet, we should get. That's a good him. idea. We we love Mission Improbable so much. John, John Woo playing himself. Yeah, uh, <laughs> a, a stunt man who legally changes his name to sound like Tom Cruise. Uh, and, and look, uh, this is there's that scene in Punch Drunk Love when um, Adam Sandler keeps talking about like DJ Justice and how comical he is. <laughs> yeah. And I always think of that when I'm like <laughs> quoting a movie verbatim or a, quoting like a sketch verbatim. But I just. The, the bit on that, when Ben Stiller says about his relationship with Tom Cruise, he says, uh, we're always finishing each other's sentences. Yeah. And then Tom Cruise <laughs> says, I don't remember a time we've ever, and then Ben Stiller cuts off, finish each other's sentences. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they just laugh back and forth. It's so good. So so when someone is like, oh, Mission Impossible 2 is not is is awful, I'm like, uh, if all it did was lead to that sketch, then the world needed it. <laughs> yeah, know? absolutely. And I love that Cruz, he never phones it in, obviously. And he did not phone it in in that sketch. I mean, there's that part where he's interviewed alone and he's talking about him. And he's like, look, look, he's harmless. He, he's harmless. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, our, our guy, John Wu, like he's great as the bar owner or bartender or whatever in Hard Boiled. Uh, but man, when... <laughs> when when they they was talking about kicking impossible or like this mission just got hell of a lot more impossible and then John Wu playing himself just says go away. Yeah. I felt that in my I felt that in my bones and I didn't know if there's like an award at the MTV Movie Awards for like best supporting actor in a MTV Movie Awards sketch. <laughs> but if there was it'd be him or Will Ferrell on the Matrix Reloaded one. Right. Yes. Like there, there's like a four year span where I, I like remember every single bit of the MTV Movie Awards and since uh, nothing. But there yeah. is there was a run that that is like burned into my brain. So. Well, I think there was actually one time to Mission Impossible three with JJ where the, it was a song about walking away from explosions. Do you remember? Does anyone remember? This? Oh, that was when Sandberg hosted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and JJ started it. JJ was an actor in uh, Six Degrees of Separation. Uh, so, you know, that was a thing I just had to say out loud. <laughs> well, is your, is this website still, is this available to anyone? Oh, thank God. No, I don't want to know anything that I actually wrote. I don't want to like, I, I used to like be really embarrassed by it, but now I just like wear it on my sleeve, like a badge of like the opposite of courage. Just like it, it's just a thing I did and I survived it. And um, it felt like I should spend a bunch of my time doing it. And on some level, you could say it's without it, would I be doing what I'm doing today? Yes, I would definitely be doing the same thing. <laughs> and I probably shouldn't have done it. So, yeah. Well, I mean, were you were you updating every day? Were you like, 
Oh, oh we yeah. hear that. Okay. I, I, dude, I had like real people on set. I'd be like a guy who was like a PA who worked like in the props department and he'd like send me the photo of like a door. Like I have <laughs> wow. like real shit. I remember one time someone sent me a photo of like a door that had like fake bullet holes in it. And I like wrote an article. I'm like, what is this door? What's, what's behind it? <laughs> I what assume is, it gets shot, but we just don't know. <laughs> the one out of all of it, the one thing that was actually interesting, even in hindsight, is um, there was like an article I wrote about when they're shooting at some famous prison in Sydney. And it was for like a breakout sequence of the bad guy breaking out. He thinks that she's been arrested for being a cat burglar or whatever. And they set that up. So he finds out and breaks her out. And in the in the movie now, you just cut to like her in a boat with him after he got her out of jail. But there was a whole sequence, and I think that's like one of the things that Stuart Baird cut out when he cut out like a gigantic third of the movie in like a week right before release. Yeah, it's, there's just like entire sequences missing, and I and I had only known about that one because I, you know, I was a uh, uh, like a newspaper man of MI2 at the time <laughs> <laughs> on like an Angel Fire webpage or something. Uh, you know, that's the one thing I like. I would love me and the four other guys in our group uh, that I don't know about and haven't met yet, but they have to exist who love this movie. Uh, I would love to see a cut or at least like figure out what really was taken out besides that. Cause I don't think it's like necessarily it was just like shortening things. I think like they cut out like subplots and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, we found a recent, a fairly recent sort of rundown of what that cut was. Where was that, Charles? Someone claimed to have a, a work print that was a VHS, and they did a, they wrote out a description of it. And so we did a whole Patreon episode about that. And uh, I'll find that web page and I'll send it to you. I'm a, I'm a member of your Patreon, as you probably know. I think I give you like <laughs> a 20 cents a month or something. But I Keeps miss- the lights on. I, yeah, I just feel like everyone needs lights, especially if they're trying to light the fuse. Yeah. But I missed that one. The one thing I did not miss was the breakdown of the script for the Oliver Stone one. <laughs> Holy shit. That blew my mind. They almost did like a, it almost felt like it was like the end of Brazil with like him in his own head. Like, like, yeah. is this real or not? Mindfuck Mission Impossible movie. Like, it's so, like, the thing about Oliver Stone that's so great about him is just drugs. Like, <laughs> Oliver Stone, there's just so many things where other people are like, I, that maybe we shouldn't do that. And he's just like, I'm on drugs. <laughs> and so... Nothing can like, stop me. Yeah, it's like, you know, he was he was on, like, hallucinogenics in an office with, like, some writer getting paid 250000 a week. And he's like, so... So like, what if he's like in a in a in a chair and it's like it's like I read about virtual reality this morning in Newsweek and you're like, holy <laughs> shit, dude. And it's funny because like the, the the stories of what almost happened are like so interesting. And that was when I was excited about it until I heard the podcast. And for a while, I was like, this should have been made. And then I reached a point where I'm like, oh god, I'm really glad that wasn't made. It just because it's the first half of it as you guys were explaining it. I was like. I was really in it and I was like engaged and then it just went crazy. Yeah. Yeah. The Carnahan one, what I was like so excited about at the time, you know, having seen NARC and all that stuff and it sounded really exciting. And then it just, I don't know if you guys know this, but they didn't make it. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like, have you guys gotten to that yet? It's like, <laughs> I, cause I, I tried to like rent it the other day and it didn't exist. I was like, what? <laughs> I remember reading about this movie, and uh, it's just not there. Carnahan has been dodging us for years, which is very disappointing, because we want him to come on and kind of tell the definitive story of what happened. And, and what it would have been. Well, like, as the world's, as the world's biggest fan of A-Team, me, yes. I, I think you should just tell him to come on here to talk about A-Team, but then bring up the other stuff. Well, apparently A-Team has set pieces that were supposed to be in his Mission Impossible. Well, remember when you guys did your John Wick series? Yes, how, how could we forget? Do an A-Team series, interview everyone involved in A-Team for my benefit, and then use that as like a misdirection. Like Ooh. Joe Carnahan, if you're listening right now, plug your ears. So Joe Carnahan will think he's just coming on here to talk about A-Team, but then he'll talk about Mission Impossible. There we go. Yeah. I'm into this. This is, like a, this is like a Mission Impossible mission. This is like a mousetrap. It's a podcast heist. 
Yeah. You know? yeah. We're gonna mousetrap uh, Joe Carnahan. And the brilliant part about it is we, it was, we said it out loud and now no one will know what we're really doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, this is why I, this is why I don't pull heist with Sick Cruise. I just keep <laughs> screwing it up. Um, I feel like a, we have a kinship because we have both wasted a lot of our not as much. You know, I don't know how many years did you do this website from like ninety eight to two thousand, so almost three years or something. Wow! So we have almost wasted the same amount of our lives on. Mission Impossible. No, you haven't wasted it because I've got to really enjoy all of it. The David Kep one was fucking amazing. Um, that was my favorite of all of them because it got really into stuff in a way that like people don't usually do. And then it was like about his dynamics with De Palma. Um, I uh, I met him on the set of Mordecai, and uh, the first thing I immediately just said was, <laughs> "I got to talk to you about Snake Eyes, man." And he said he looked at me like. <laughs> Like I may have been the first person who ever exists to, to like out of his whole filmography. Yeah. Like there's probably like a couple guys who are wild and they're like, let's talk about the shadow. But no one walks up and they're like Snake Eyes. And to be fair, Snake Eyes is fucking awesome. Like, you know, Mission Impossible 2, like I kind of understand why some people don't like it sort of, you know, I get it. But if you don't like Snake Eyes, I'm just like, you don't like art, you know? It's just, it's also like if you've ever doubted Nick Cage as a performer, if you watch that movie and realize that he had to maintain the same energy and like peaks and valleys of his performance in each of the takes. And so they could be like from multiple angles when they're doing flashbacks later. And the fact that he's, he's sticking with his choices the whole time. Yeah. It's like a lot of people have a misperception of cage where it's sort of like, he's just kind of random. It's like, sometimes he'll be big. Sometimes he'll be small, but snake eyes. It's like, he's like a Swiss watch of like fucking acting or something. It's a great movie. Let's just talk about Snake Eyes this whole time. Yeah, hey, we we're big De Palma fans, obviously. We, so we're obsessed with that. Uh, the you know the monsoon ending or whatever. Oh uh, man, like that's the that's to me like a lot of people are like, oh, the the other cut of Magnificent Ambersons or or whatever. <laughs> to me, I'm just like, I want the original Snake Eyes cut, man. I don't care if test audiences didn't like it. Snake Eyes was not for normies, you know. Snake yeah. Eyes was for people who exactly. are like really into dope shit. Yeah, you know. So after after two comes out, you stuck with the franchise. I mean, were you as as excited for for three? Did your excitement wane? Well, three is like my least favorite, but I like them all. The I I have never. I mean, I shouldn't say shit like this, but like I've never since the after the first viewing, I've never been able to watch Mission Impossible three in one sitting. I always like watch it and like it's the only of the movies that I always sort of just I'll watch like forty five minutes and then watch forty five minutes because to me, it has that same thing I get with like a lot of Bond movies. So there's some Bond movies that are so episodic, and there's like such a variation of like the sequences that it sort of doesn't it, like. There's some that I like way more than others, but for me, it's like the movie kind of dies after they get the rabbit's foot. But at the same time, I really like, like it's one of the most sort of like instant blockbuster first time director movies ever. And I like, because I think you guys were talking about your thing with Dan Mandel, where it's like JJ just been like, I really like how any enemy the state looks like, why does it look like that? And that's sort of the same way, like I got into understanding filmmaking is it's just sort of like, I knew what I liked and how, why, and I had to figure out why it looked that way and then figure out stuff I didn't like and figure out why it didn't look like that. But all the episodes about three, I really love. And there's no universe where it's a bad movie. Like there's nothing in the movie that I don't like. It just, to me, it's like kind of the most uneven of all of them. And also just, I, I kind of want to know what they're going after. Like we still don't know what the rabbit's foot is. Like, on one hand, it's like I like when you have to like guess what the, is in the briefcase. And I also just made a movie where I explained fucking nothing. So I'm a big hypocrite. But, you know, I'm like, ju just say it's a nuke. Like, yeah. otherwise, I'm just like, what was it? Yeah. What, what, what was the rabbit's foot? But Ghost Protocol to me was like, I saw it three times at the CityWalk IMAX. And I have like a deathly fear of heights. So that was the most bang for my buck. Like, there's no haunted house I've ever been to. There's no anything I've ever done that was like as thrilling as like watching that sequence at the City Walk IMAX, like center, center. And, but that movie was also when I went from loving Tom Cruise to thinking that like, 
he may be the best movie star of all time. And I know the exact moment, which is when he yells no shit um, <laughs> at them because his entire career, he's always playing guys who are like inc always capable and sort of like, you wish you were that badass, like and this unkillable dude with perfect gadgets and Brad Bird humanizing him by having the gadgets not work. Like to me was like an exact, like if you look at Cruz's whole career, that was the first time where he started doing stuff like that. And Edge of Tomorrow is a whole movie of a guy failing. And what I realized watching Ghost Protocol is like, Cruz has that Kurt Russell thing, which is like, they're really charming when they're trying to succeed and then they fuck up or like when they're trying to succeed and then suddenly like they realize like what they have to do is like, like in fallout when he's like realizing yes, he's like jump out a window. Like I can't remember that exact gag. Um, yeah. But everything after that, like when he, when he like comes back from death and rogue nation is like fucking incredible. Like Tom Cruise being a badass who also like, Oh, might die is really engaging like it's like as likable as like he can be to me like I, you know i love edge of tomorrow that's probably my favorite mission possible movie i'm kidding it's a stupid <laughs> joke but i love him in that movie just failing forever and then becoming badass yeah that's why i, pr I think i like top gun's like a better movie than days of thunder but i used to prefer days of thunder because I like just the thing of like, he's a badass, but then he, when he like tells Duvall, he's like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> like He's just like, he admits, like, he's like, I don't, he's like, I don't know. What's the gas. He's like, what's, what are brakes? <laughs> he's a racer. It's like, I love the disarming side of him. And I thought Brad Bird just figured out such a brilliant way to like, cause like three had this amazing value because it figured out a way to like start using the action of two, but with a lot of the kind of, espionage, globetrotting sort of stuff of the first one. Like it was kind of a hybrid of the two, but then Ghost Protocol made it feel like they could make 20 of them because you kind of were worried for Ethan in the way that I wasn't in the first three, you know? And it's been the same ever since. And then the, the other thing that I find annoying, <laughs> the thing that really grinds my gears, I know when, when people are like tweeting about the Mission Impossible movies when they rewatch them, and a lot of times people say something like, you know, I just rewatched the first one and like, it doesn't really have that many stunts. And you're like, yeah, that's not, that's not what the movies were. Like they became that later. Like, yeah, there's a context to this. Like the De Palma didn't need to do stunts. Like the, the brilliant thing of like the way the franchise evolved to me, it was like, once you added like the daredevil aspect to it, it kept it from being stale, but you didn't need that in the first movie. Like you don't like when he's like that, but now that's like the thing why they can never really be boring because he might die making them, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 I think that element of him screwing up that was introduced in four is, is so important and something that people never cite for some reason. We're always like, that's where it was introduced, but yeah, it's like when there's just so many great, weird, vulnerable moments of him in that movie it, it, which is more like sort of like Harrison Ford was someone who always nailed that because like Indiana Jones would like on a dime have this look of like nothing can phase me and then suddenly like oh I'm gonna die like that kind <laughs> yeah, of right. way and and that was what Brad, Brad Bird cited Raiders of the Lost Ark and Die Hard when he was making Ghost Protocol that was like his his touchstone for it was Indiana Jones and John McClane McClane is like that that's the exact way I always describe it. it's like Ghost Protocol is the first time where like you added a little bit of like the barefoot McClane thing to Ethan and that makes Ethan it just way more interesting because like you have like all these weird things go wrong but you know he's going to succeed but it's more fun to kind of like create conflict for him or like have the sequences like where you're like oh like yeah he's definitely going to do this and then everything goes wrong you know, that stuff to me is super fun. It's like, it's like the first three movies, there's more of like a gritty determination to get it done. Like he's going to get it done. It's, it's very serious. And then starting with four, it's more like, well, I'm going to do this, but fuck, that seems really hard. <laughs> yeah. And I like that he's sort of, uh, that he's, it's like, it seems like really hard. And Ethan just reaches a point where he's like, guys, we're going to do this. Like, what's the plan? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> like, like, just, he's like, but, but I know we'll come up with one because we have to. It's like Ethan, yeah. 
Like, I feel like the reason it turned that way in the Quarry ones is because it's a metaphor for writing those movies where you're like, yeah. you, you're like, we have to have a set piece here. I don't know the fuck it's going to be, but we're going to figure it out before <laughs> we're shooting at that location. And now Ethan is like McCory in the movies. He's like, let's just go to France. The bad guy's there. We'll figure it out. And then, you know, he sort of does or he doesn't, but then something happens and he reacts to it. And that's just the creative process of you know, making one of these movies yeah. based on this podcast I've been listening to uh, <laughs> where they, everyone talks about what happened. And we're back. Ben David Grubinski, part one in the books. What a great guy. Yeah. We will obviously share a photo of his IMF tattoo. Uh, we'll have that in our show notes, and we'll probably put it on social media as well if he lets us. And uh, it's worth worth taking a look. It's pretty cool that he, he he did that. Although everything that comes out of his mouth is a joke, so I feel like it's possible it could be an elaborate joke that he just drew that on his hand, on his arm, and, and it's, it's just plain like it's an actual tattoo yeah he's very sardonic <laughs> but we should also try to like dig up his his uh, mission impossible 2 fan site i can. know can someone out there find that and 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 bring it forth so we can we, we want to look at all the scoops i love hearing about all that stuff you know i mean like the, that they filmed a scene that was a breakout of an australian prison you know to get i guess tandy newton out or something or i don't i mean who would be in the prison maybe it's our favorite it was character. tandy because they they, they, oh. they put tandy in the prison and then they just make it seem like she just gets out. It's like a, a pretty quick edit of her just getting out, and they're just like bringing her via motorboat or whatever. But I wonder if I guess they actually physically broke her out of prison. Maybe Ooh, that would be cool. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Hopefully, more stuff with Billy Bart. Yeah, Billy. Uh, is it Baird? Billy, Billy Baird, Baird. I think we gotta get him <laughs> on the show at some point. But I also forgot he brought up that J.J. Uh, Abrams wrote Gone Fishing. Which yeah, I, I've never seen, but uh, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, and then also his MI two thesis I thought was pretty interesting. That uh, you know he thinks that if a movie star had played the Sean Ambrose part, then um, you know maybe if it was a bigger movie star than than Delroy Scott, then maybe the movie would have worked in a way that people wouldn't be shitting on it all the time. Unfortunately, they do. Yeah, I mean, how do you? I don't know who would be the kind of like ultimate to face off against Cruz, but. I think it would have probably helped a lot, for sure. And I don't yeah. think uh, wasn't he? he Dory Scott was always in that role. Nobody was. He didn't replace anybody, right? No, he didn't. But like, imagine if it was like I don't know, Nicolas Cage or something. Yeah, I mean that would be great. Robert Redford, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. It's, anyway, uh, something to think about. Well, what else, Charles? Well, actually, this is uh, this is only part one. So of course, come back. We will have part two next week. And uh, there's plenty more from Ben David. Uh, he's hilarious, and you got to come back and hear him talk and give us rankings of the movies. And we talk about a lot of other stuff as well. He wrote a Jackie Chan movie, so we talk about that a little bit as well. He's got some funny stories. So, yeah, but, but everybody should sign up for our Patreon, patreon.com slash light the fuse. We actually just did a trailer breakdown of the new Top Gun Maverick uh, trailer, which we saw at CinemaCon way, way back in August, and and now it's actually finally out. And so we did a big breakdown of that trailer that was on Patreon. We've done, we've done other stuff on our Patreon every week. There's bonus episodes. So please, please sign up there. And also check out our Tee Public store, which is linked through our website, lightthefusepodcast.com, in the merch section. Also go to the show notes in our episode guide. Look at every episode and all the elaborate show notes that we've done. Uh, buy a shirt from our Tee Public store or a, a mask or whatever you want, a laptop case, iPhone case, stickers, magnets, pins, all kinds of fun things. And uh, what else, Drew? Uh, you can follow us on social media at Light the Fuse Pod on Twitter and Instagram and reach out to us there if you have any show ideas or people you want us to talk to. And also follow us just because that's the first place where all the breaking news is going to go. We're going to put it up on our social media feeds. And yeah, if you could like, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening to this podcast, it would be a big help. Um, but we'll be back next week with Ben David Part 2, and we got a lot of great stuff coming up, so please be sure to come back. Before we go, actually, I want to say uh, that uh, a very special thank you to Robbie J. Martin, uh, and uh, one of our loyal Patreon followers has been with us for a long time. And I also want to say this uh, episode was uh, mixed and edited by Luke Burson, and the music was by Kevin Blumenfeld. And that's it. We'll see you next week. Thanks.
Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod, and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.